The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. that something supernatural has been happening uh, in Jennifer and I's prayer time. And um, <clears throat> Daniel 7, verses 25 through 27. Daniel chapter 7 is, Daniel had many visions, and, 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 uh, and <clears throat> but there was a pattern and a principle. I think there's a lot of things in Scripture that follow a pattern and a principle. And the pattern and the principle here was that he shall speak pompous words. This is evil. Evil, whether it's coming through an individual, but it's all under the prince of the power of the air, okay? The, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High God. It'll be an anti-Christ. It'll be an anti-God voice, all right? And every voice has a significant power behind it. And it said, he will speak pompous words against the Most High and shall, one translation says persecute, but the better translations all say literally wear out. He that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. The enemy, nothing but if I can't get you to backslide because you're a Christian and, and, and you would say, but I love Jesus and I, I, I belong. He has a tactic for you that's apart from backsliding, he wants to wear out the saints of the Most High God. That strategy works so efficiently with Christians. And it also opens up a whole new avenue of, of, of uh, powers that want to dictate how you live your life. So he shall speak pompous words against God, and he shall wear out the saints of the Most High God. And intend to change the times and the seasons, all right? But we want to enter into what God's time is and what God's season is. We don't care about how someone wants to divert the times and the seasons. Because, you know, God will take you by the easiest way you're willing to go, and the enemy can get you to delay the things that he's got for you, all right? God's uh, always on time, but you are not necessarily always on time. And there's an influence, and it says... Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and a half. And it's talking about end times. But the court shall be seated and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Now I know there's application for, from an eschatological point of view. But I'm just seeing the pattern and the principle is that thus saith the Lord. He wants to wear out the saints. The ones who are not backslidden. The ones who do not want to backslide. He said then I've got plan B for you. I'm going to wear you out. I'm going to motivate you and compel you and drive you. Now, what are the sons of God? They are what? Led by the Spirit. We're to follow Jesus. What's the implication there? Is the initiator is the Spirit of God within us. He's the one who is both the author and the finisher. He needs to be the beginner, but it needs to be in a very practical way. If you're being pushed to and fro and being, being uh, coerced and compelled and stressed and pressured, then you need to pay close attention to this because we're going to see you get set free today. I'm convinced that God has exposed uh, some of the darkness that's been around people oppressing them. He would love to oppress you. He would love for you to obsess. You know, ob obsess is to spend too much time on any one person, place, or thing. If he can get you to obsess, he can drain you like a, a, like a battery. If he can get you to be impulsive in any way, shape, or form, to push you, to drive you, to impel you, to compel you, that's the opposite of being led by the Spirit of God. And we'll get into that, but listen to this verse. But then there's a switch that takes place. And I know that, that the kingdom of God, in, in reference to these patterns and principles, the kingdom was, the kingdom is, and the kingdom is yet to come. So there's all three applications. But currently, the kingdom of God is, and it says, 
And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, to the saints, to the holy ones, the saints of the Most High God. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall serve and obey Him. Those who do wickedly against the covenant shall corrupt with flattery, but they that know their God shall be strong and carry out exploits. And if you're sons of, the, of God, you're going to be led by the Spirit. You're going to be strong. You're going to know your God. All true fruitfulness comes out of intimacy. You can't skip intimacy and then do things with God. Intimacy is spirit to spirit, heart to heart, relationship. Out of that intimacy, basically, all true fruitfulness flows. Not dead works, not gee, the Christian thing to do. By the way, you know, spirits of religion will drive you to do the Christian thing to do, but you're not necessarily being led by the Spirit. If you're not enjoying an intimate relationship with Him, there's all kinds of good deeds you could go. Matter of fact, you could get worn out doing good deeds. Yeah. And none of, none of them even being God-directed. Just good ideas. What would Jesus do is probably one of the worst things that was ever introduced into the church if it's not properly applied. It's a nice saying. You should know the Bible, know what Jesus would do. But in all cases, there's a time to speak and there's a time to remain silent. For everything under heaven, there's a season. You need to be in communication with God, walking in intimacy to know what season it is. People will have a tendency to tell you what you should do. Okay, based on some kind of a scriptural Christian concept. Well, that's wonderful, but if they're not the voice of the Lord, I'm not listening. I don't need more good ideas. I need His mind, His will, His emotions. I need to be directed by Him. People always have, they have an idea of what you should do. The funny thing is, is if they see the need, they should be fulfilling the need. Right? It's in their jurisdiction. But, it says, <clears throat> for as many as are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God. But there was a scripture that came uh, up this week sometime. Uh, I think it's 2 Corinthians 10, 6, where it says, through your obedience, you can punish disobedience. And I was looking at that. I kind of overlooked that in times past. In your obedience, you can punish disobedience. In other words, you, cannot, you do not have the authority to rebuke unless you're walking in obedience. You ever, have you ever had people straighten you out that weren't walking the walk themselves? <laughs> you don't need that advice. You need, you need to be able to have the anointing and the authority of God behind a rebuke, and you can't punish something that you're not walking in. I just love that in the Didache, in the early church, that first century church, they basically said, you know, if the prophet's not living what he's preaching, don't listen to him. He's false. Oh, you mean you're required to live what you're saying? Wow. There's some pressure there, huh? But anyway, this, this Daniel chapter 7 is God just tell me there's a time, there's a switch, there's a turnaround. And that, the, that basically the enemy's trying to wear out the saints, but the tables are turned. And the victory is in the side of the saints of the Most High God. And I believe they're going to be able to punish the disobedience with their obedience. And so, um, <clears throat> I want to start with making sure that we minister to uh, any blind spots as a believer. So, what would the blind, primary blind spot be for the believer? It was all through Scripture, actually, in the epistles, was the battle between law and grace, knowing that having started in the spirit, there's still a potential that you can try to work it out in the flesh. And this enemy is able to harass far too many believers because they've given the enemy legal ground. You've given him space. You've given him place. You've given him a door of opportunity. And so it, it basically is saying... Uh, Proverbs 26, 2, you've probably heard this, like a flitting sparrow, like a flying swallow, so a curse without a cause shall not alight. Without giving place 
you can't be cursed. If you're seeing a repetitive attack against your life, it's quite possible there's some carnality in you that's giving it a place to rest and that you can actually draw it to yourself. You can't live in sin and expect to get something from God. Hmm? I saw people that basically suffered their weakness. Well, I'll say one of their weaknesses was in the area of finances. What they didn't realize was that all the excuses they made in finances and all the struggles they had with repetitive finances was based that you had an open door of greed. And, you can, and the early church taught that the whole purpose of even tithing is to be a fence against greed. That it all belongs to God, but to keep you from having a place in the heart for greed, you nip it while it's little. Nip it while it's not that powerful in your life. And I believe that what God's saying right now, clearly, is there is a religious spirit that the church needs deliverance from. And it would be a blind spot because a Christian that loves God wouldn't know they got it if they had it until the Holy Spirit reveals it, right? Well, I want the Holy Spirit to reveal it. And one of the ways He reveals it is if, one, you're stressed out, tired, weary. That's telling me there is a force pushing and pulling you that may sound very religious, but if it's not God. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I want to be led by the Spirit. Follow Jesus means who's leading? Jesus, right? And if we're going to be followers, we're not the initiators. And quite frankly, to be honest with you, when you get on fire for God, there's a tendency to want to do stuff in the flesh because it's what Jesus would do, or so you think. That was my first rebuke as a baby Christian. I mean, well, I went to this little Pentecostal church, and I was a former Catholic, and I don't know how much I knew at the time, but somehow with my baptism in the Holy Spirit, I attracted all my Catholic friends. And we went to this church of about... Uh, I think it was about 100 people, and we doubled it with all my Catholic friends because they, they respected me. And so they went to the same church I went to, and we had 200 people. And, and by goodness, these Pentecostal people didn't know what to do. They went, oh, dear Lord, Jesus, Mary, rosaries, all these people. What are we going to do with these people? What are, I mean, who knows where they're coming from? And... and uh, it was like I had all these things I wanted to do, 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 do. And finally a prophetess came up to me, a woman prophetess, and she went to pray over me and laughed hysterically for about 10 minutes. I'm going, I don't know if I like this prophetic word. She's laughing, I don't she laughing at me, laughing with me. Is this the joy of the Lord? Am I doing something wrong? It feel, felt like a forever. And she's laughing and she says, the Lord just gave me a vision of you, Dennis. She says, Jesus loves your heart, but you're going to have to learn you're going to do it his way. She says, I saw in the vision, Dennis had Jesus' hand and was dragging him everywhere, telling Jesus what he ought to do. Now over here, Jesus, you ought to take, and over here, Jesus, come on, right, this person right here, come on, Jesus. Let, let. And she says, you're going to learn that you work for him. And he doesn't work for you. Oh, oh I think I, I must have gotten really down. I'm going, I don't know how to stop. What do I, has you ever felt like you don't know how to stop? And I had to learn it in various forms, various lessons. I would be in a prayer group, and it was a circle of the pastor, and he would put every, all the chairs in a circle, and and he would, he would strum on this thing. I don't even know what it was called. It was some kind of a little zither type thing. Uh, and he would strum and he'd sing with a real terrible voice. And he would sing and worship. And, and then I would think of something to say. And I just blurted it out. And then after I blurted it out, and I thought, this is what Jesus is saying. This is what God is saying. And he probably was saying it. But he didn't mean for me to say it. Did you ever realize that some of the things he's saying is for you first? Before you blurt it out and try to change the world, it just could be for you. You know, first apply it. Remember, you, you can't punish disobedience until you've been obedient. So I basically 
would blurt it out, and then I would feel this horrible feeling like thud. Have you ever had a thud? Like, oh, man, I blew it big time. But what I said wasn't bad. It was that it wasn't God leading me to say it. It was like, mm, you're supposed to be listening, absorbing, assimilating, <laughs> allowing God to change you before you go change everybody else. All right? So little by little, I learned. And he took me to the school of the Spirit. And one of the first things that he taught me was that you haven't really anything to say, Dennis. I know you're a talker, and I know you can't shut up. But you're <laughs> going to learn to shut up because you don't have anything to say until you heard something. <laughs> Do you realize what that means? That means I have to emphasize listening, not talking. But I thought with, with the multitude of words, I'm bound to say something good. And he goes, in the multitude of words, sin doesn't lack either. <laughs> oh, okay, maybe I better choose my words more carefully. That's right. You don't have anything to say until you've heard something. So he basically took me to the school of the Spirit, and he showed me that what I want is the same thing that Jesus had in his earth walk, and that he said, the ruler of this world is coming, but he doesn't have anything in me. Then the Lord was saying, you've got so many things in you that people could push your buttons and get you to do all this kinds of reaction. I don't want anything in you. I don't want you to give place to the enemy. And I don't even want your Christian enthusiasm to be nothing more than dead works. How many of you know, friends, maybe you've done it yourself, burned out when you first got saved? Burned out, you know what that burned out was? A lot of that wasn't God. A lot of that was your good ideas, and good is not necessarily God. Remember, there was a tree, two trees in the garden, good and evil, and the tree of life. Not everything's coming from the tree of life. Just because it's scriptural doesn't mean that it was God leading you. We need that intimacy for true fruitfulness, don't we? Because all true fruitfulness comes out of intimacy. But anyway, I want to get into what, what the Lord was saying. So <clears throat> uh, if you don't give place to him, if he has nothing in you, then you're free to respond to God and let the pieces fall where they will. Drivenness or being compelled is a sign that you are being oppressed or controlled by the prince of the power of the air. Now, <clears throat> when, when uh, I looked at, at what God was trying to do, I said, I want to close these doors. And that's when he taught me, first of all, if I knit you together in my mother's womb, I'm not interested in your intelligence or your opinions or your special insight of what you think about you. If you want to know the purpose of a thing, don't go to the thing, including you. Go to the Creator. And so I went to him and I said, search me, O oh God. And he says, I'm going to tell you something. Dennis, I knit you together in your mother's womb. If there's anything that needs fixed in there, if I knit it together, if I was the manufacturer, if I was the Creator, then let me fix it. Be God-searched. You're searching. I don't care how smart you are. You're not smart enough. You know, why should the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? Right? It's an insult. So God showed me, and, and note takers, you need to write this down. This will change your life. You can have all kinds of religious ideas. You can have all kinds of things of what you think Jesus should do and what you think other Christians should do. <laughs> but basically, God said, sequence. Write that word down. Sequence is one of the most significant truths for your Christian life. If he knit you together and there needs to be any rep, rep, uh, repairing or restoration, let his sequence, let him pick the cherry, so to speak. You let God search your heart. You open to him and let him do the searching, not man. And man means you too. Don't you do the searching. Search me, O oh God, for anxious thoughts and hurtful ways. A God-searched individual is one who is going to close the doors to the enemy and prevent those religious spirits from driving you and impelling you, distracting you, and pulling you away. He knit you together, and God says, and I want to fix anything that needs fixed but it'll be in my sequence, in my order, in my time. Now, you can make it last longer. You can make it last your whole lifetime if you drag your feet. But God says, I would like to bring an accelerated work to you. 
And this is what Jennifer learned. She was so passionate and hungry to be discipled. She had it all up here. I'm, she wasn't impressed with herself, nor was she impressed with other people. She could easily have been a member of Mensa, you know, that's for geniuses. But she's not impressed with intellect because intellect minus good judgment equals foolishness. You know, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Those are intelligent people. They could have a high IQ. But Bible calls them foolish because they're in rebellion to the Lordship of Jesus. They're in rebellion to finding out the truth from Him. And He Himself is the truth. So it requires humility for that intellect to really pursue God and to be knit together and let God untangle it. I love David when he used to say, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant from presumptuous sin so that they wouldn't have dominion on me. Therefore, I will be innocent of the great transgression. This is what the rabbis taught. The, this is what the early apostles taught Jewish believers and Gentile believers in that first century. They taught them basically deal with it while it's little before it becomes damaging. So if someone's in adultery, someone's fornicating, someone's living in sexual sin, that didn't just fall out of the sky. That didn't just, oh, it accidentally happened. No, it didn't. You had a lust problem for a long period of time. You didn't deal with it. And eventually, it grows. It gets stronger. And you can't resist. Murder? You didn't murder. You didn't murder somebody just fell out of the sky in a fit of rage. You had an anger problem that was unresolved. You talked bad about people. You were a, a, a murderer even with your mouth and your words before you ever committed murder. Hatred, malice, all of those things were already in their building. But if you would have dealt with it in the small scale, see in this church here, this is a hard church to come to, I think, because we're going to expect you to deal with your fences. We don't baby anybody because we're going to teach you how, what we teach is self-deliverance. We're not even going to do the deliverance for you. <laughs> You're supposed to have Jesus on the inside of you. Let's, why don't we require an, of him to accomplish what he wants to do in you? You're a believer. You're not like some unbeliever that you need someone to constantly do it to you. You know, there's contributors and there's consumers. The consumers don't really get far in Christianity. They're looking for someone else to do to them what they should have been doing for themselves. Now, is there time where you confess your faults one to another that you might be healed? Yeah, as long as you're willing to do you and Jesus work it out. This is not, this is not kindergarten. This is not baby. We're entering into a season where God is already marking out there, there's plenty of people in the body who already are drifting apart from that relationship that's in him. We're dealing like with the Laodicean church. And he says, you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other, but otherwise I got to spit you out of my mouth. Now God's basically saying, the curse without a cause does not alight. So if you're under constant pressure, we want to break that today. And if you're watching by YouTube, we want that broken in your life. But it's self-deliverance. If you've got Jesus in you, you've got the resources to do it. But you've got to identify when there's religious spirits operating. You know, uh, it's, it's a couple of scriptures that I want you to see, and then we're going to minister to this. Probably scriptures you might not pay a lot of attention to. So this would be good to make a note. Galatians 4.3. Galatians 4.3 says, Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Now you can read through that real fast. Oh, the elements of the world, worldliness. Who is the prince of the power of the air? That's evil. That's not just flesh. That's the demonic spirit that has rule. He is the prince of the power of the air. Jesus himself in his earth walk said, the prince of this world is coming, but he has nothing in me. Did he say? He's in charge of this world. Yeah, God's kingdom is greater, 
But he's also saying in the world, this prince, but he has nothing in me. And he's setting an example that you could be in this world, not of it. Under the prince of the power of the air. So Galatians 4.3 basically says, this term, even so when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. That is evil spirits. You thought when you weren't serving God that you were just doing what you wanted to do. You had no idea that you were being led by the nose, by powers greater than your will. And you convinced yourself you're just doing what you wanted to do. Well, I can remember in the drug scene, I thought I was just doing what I wanted to do until it was time to quit. Then I found out, oh, I guess I'm not as powerful to quit doing what I wanted to do. How come I was, this is what I want to do. Don't worry about it. I can control it. Until I couldn't control it, then you have a rude awakening, right? All of a sudden, it's like, well, I thought I, well, I mean, I was just doing what, well, right? But there's a, a realm that needs to be understood, and the reason I'm emphasizing this is Galatians 4.9. Now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turned again to these weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage. It's talking about the elements of the world, the elementary systems that are under the prince of the power of the air. They are demonic spirits. But how would they work? How would they work in Galatians? How would they work on believers? They would be religious. Isn't that subtle? He would drive and impel you to religious activity that has nothing to do with God. Relationships that have nothing to do with God. Religious spirits apply pressure to condemn. Jesus does not condemn you. If you're in sin, what do you do? You repent. And you walk in the light as he is in the light. You have fellowship one with another. Legalism. When they, everybody hears a hard sermon, it's always legalism. Legalism is you trying. I'm talking about you trusting. If you're trusting God, you can't be worn out and trusting God at the same time. The enemy wants to wear out the saints of the Most High God. Now, the Most High God, the saints, means the holy ones. He wants to wear out the holy ones. He wants to get you distracted. He doesn't want you walking in peace that rules in your heart. He wants you to find something to obsess over, something to feel driven about. I can remember being uh, traveling a lot in New England. You know, they have a, uh, New England had a good work ethic, but it was almost to the point where it was being demonically driven well, it was in many cases, Christians, because they'd go, I'd go, how you doing? Oh, good, good. Oh, busy, busy. Oh, frazzled, frazzled. What, what did that, what was that? That was like, I'm a hard worker with a good work ethic, and a good work ethic is strong. The scripture says you don't work, you don't eat. And that's the way it should be. But at the same time, frazzled, where is that? Where is that in the scripture? Where is worn out? If you're physically tired, you go to bed. He gives his beloved sleep. If you exercise a long time and you're tired, that's normal. But if you're tired of life, there's something seriously wrong. You're being oppressed, and there must have, he must have found a link in you, a point of connection. Because Jesus said, the prince of the power of the air, he's coming, but he has nothing in me. So who's he looking for? Someone that he can have place with. Someone who's got a button that they can push, drive, impel, wear out the saints of the Most High God. Well, I'm believing there is a season right now where God's grace is being made available that there's a transition for whosoever will. Now, that will, of course, is going to require keeping the doors closed. <laughs> He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Led by the Spirit. That means he followed the Spirit going, this is going to be an opportunity to be an overcomer. 
I'm moving in this direction, not out of frustration, but in response to the Holy Spirit, to meet the devil head on and defeat him in my body, in my soul, and in my spirit so that others may enter into that kind of victory. He's get, he went to that for your victory. So for you to be worn out, tired, bummed out, depressed, there's a place in you that's giving into it. There's something where you're not satisfied with God alone. You want Jesus plus something. And that place is where he's going to torment. Do you know all temptation is absolutely tailor-made for you? So wherever you're getting hit over and over again, duh, <laughs> that's the place. Right? Anybody have the same old, same old? How come in all these areas? You know what? If you're having trouble in your finances, do you give? I mean, really, do you give? Not tip. Do you give? Maybe some of that you brought it upon yourself. The curse causeless does not alight unless there is an opportunity or a vacancy where you can draw that to yourself. What about rejection? This just simply amazes me. Amazes me. After you're a believer, rejection should be a foreign element. It should have been something that belonged to the world, the flesh and the devil, not you. Rejection. Baby believers in the first century were mentored to bless them that curse you, to pray for them who despitefully use you. If somebody picked on you and you can't get over it, you're, you're kindergarten in your Christianity. God went to great price to forgive. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Unilaterally, he didn't wait for them to reciprocate. I've heard people say all kinds of strange things like, how to love people who don't love you back. You're supposed to love them. We love because he first loved us. It isn't about them loving back. That's what the world and the flesh and selfishness. Adult adolescence. we don't need that. What we need is basically what that early church, now these were baby Christians in the first century who basically blessed them, that cursed them. Instead of, oh, poor me, they're picking, so-and-so's picking on me, and this person's picking on me, and this person's picking on me. Instead, they blessed them, that cursed them. Fasted for their enemies. When's the last time you fasted for an enemy? Don't raise your hand because it probably won't be many. <laughs> That's the truth. But when you fast and pray, you know what would happen if you sacrifice? Fasting is a certain sacrifice, right? At some level, it's a sacrifice. If you're honoring God with it, and you fast and you pray for people that have picked on you, your heart changes and you see that they're the ones that need Jesus. And there's no such thing as being a victim. Grow up, church. If you're still a victim, you're seriously in kindergarten. Bless them that curse. You can't, if you can't get past love your enemies, your Christianity is just like a club. You go to church as like a member of a club until you can really find out that what God called you to do was not to be a part of the world, not to act like the, the world loves them that love them back. That's not a big treat. You know, I used to watch all those mafia movies. Man, I'll tell you what, one thing they loved was their family. I mean, they might kill everybody else, but... <laughs> They love their family. <laughs> Jesus said, this is my mother, my brother, and my sisters. They who do the will of God from the heart. Hmm? We sometimes hold up in esteem that which is not even God. The principle of resistance was that after Jesus was in that wilderness, tempted, overcame with those three temptations, spirit, soul, and body, demonstrated for us the victory by the power of the Holy Spirit. I like the way he came out of the wilderness. He came out in the power of the Spirit. Said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to set the captives free. You're not going to, you don't have enough anointing to blow the fuzz off a peanut while you're in unforgiveness. Really. Watch Christians in, uh, in intercession and getting mad. Oh, break that devil. And I'm sitting there thinking, until you break the devil in you, you're saying all the right words when you're not, you know, there's nothing happening. You're just angry. 
I can still remember I was a young pastor. It was my first group of intercessors. And the first woman that said she was an intercessor and she's going to do this prayer. And she says, my daughter's smoking them cigarettes and I'm praying, God, you burn her lips. Burn her lips real good, God. And I'm going, oh, dear Lord. <laughs> it's like, that's intercession? That's an angry mother. First deal with your anger, then bless your daughter. Pray for harm to come to her because she was smoking them cigarettes. Oh, Lord. It's amazing what we call Christianity and what we even call intercession. True intercession always flows out of love. Love precedes peace. Peace precedes your discernment of, of the flow of God. God's not going to flow in your river just because you say all the right words. Out of your belly flows a river. And that river's got to be the Spirit of God. But Luke, Luke 4, Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit, and the news of him went around. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovery of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bound. So basically, here's where it's going to be. And if you're watching for the first time, you're going, I never heard preaching like this. That's, he sounds angry. <laughs> Whatever. He's a legalist. Whatever. You know, it's so funny because people basically will do anything. Jason covered it real good in his last message. You need to get that, that series. But there's three kinds of people. There's people that are, that are wise, and the wise will listen to instruction, whether it's comfortable or not. The foolish will try to fix what they're saying to make it comfortable. <laughs> and then evil will just get mad and gnash their teeth. Gee, we saw a lot of that in the Bible with Jesus, didn't they? And who, who was it that gnashed their teeth at Jesus the most? Religious people. Religious people. I went to Russia, and we were doing mime on the streets in, 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 in St. Petersburg. And drawing crowds of probably close to 100, 200 people. Uh, we saw drunks with their, they used to drink in the park a lot. They would take their booze and go sit in the park bench and drink. We saw them sober up and get saved in the park. We saw doing mime on the streets and people coming. And then all of a sudden, all these people looked hungry. All of them were open. And whether they accepted it or rejected it, none of them were mean until... The Russian Orthodox priests came to see what we were doing, dressed in black robes. And they came, and if you could look, I wish I had a picture of their faces, all gnarled and... <laughs> and Whoa, this is scary. We got to do some deliverance here. What are those people? Oh, they're religious people. Okay, there's nothing meaner on the face of the earth than a mean religious person. Trust me, I'll take an unsaved person any day than a mean religious person. Wow. I mean, we had soldiers there. Who knows? They could have been KGB watching us and everything else. And they were open to the mime. They were open to the gospel. They were listening attentively until the religious people came with their black robes and their, and their snarls on their face. Man, if I wasn't secure in God, I'd have been afraid. Not of the KGB, not of the military, but of the religious people. So you want to get set free, I'm going to give you some simple, simple steps in your relationship. Number one, you've heard this a million times. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee unless he has place in you. If the curse causeless does not alight, if you can't submit to God and see it flee, there's something in you that gives it permission. You give place. I don't want no landing strip for the enemy, and neither do you. Submit to God by yielding your will. And the first thing and the most important thing any individual has to learn is that your will is here. It's not about what you think. This is where you opened your heart to receive him. As you received him, you're supposed to walk. Well, how did you receive him? You yielded. You surrendered. You're supposed to walk that way. And God is giving the supernatural strength because in Daniel when it says that the enemy's going to try to wear out the saints, but there's going to be a turning of the tables, 
and, the, and it's going to be given to the saints to have dominion and authority, guess what? They're going to be strong. Why? Because they know their God. Daniel 11.32. Because they know their God, they shall be strong, and then they will do exploits. You're not going to see the exploits without being strong, and you're not going to be strong without knowing God. It's going to all true fruitfulness comes from intimacy. So, it goes to submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Submit to God by yielding your will. Any over, emotional overreaction is place for the enemy. Anything that you overreact. And you know, other people will see the overreaction. So hopefully that humbles you. Like if your wife said, um, Oh, honey, I know it's not your favorite, but I made, I made uh, chicken this evening for dinner. Chicken! Oh, my God! You know I hate chicken. Um, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. Chicken. Uh, we've had chicken last week. Oh, uh. If that's the reaction, there is obviously some place you're giving place when the reaction outweighs the stimulus. Hmm? So what got you overreact? Look at that person in the, they took my place in the parking lot. Oh my God. And have a meltdown. And look demonic while you're having the meltdown. <laughs> well then convince everybody around you that you have issues. And they're not really listening to the content of your explanation. They're looking at your behavior. Jennifer and I always talk about the time we were in the Winn-Dixie because <laughs> we both looked at each other. That man with the three-piece suit who was upset with Winn-Dixie for whatever reason and he was on his tiptoes going, I would never buy anything in this store. Nobody should ever buy anything in this store again. And Jennifer and I looked at each other. Damage, age three. Still operating because they've given place to that. It doesn't go away with chron chronology. Just because you got older, he's still a three-year-old emotionally. He's still behaving like you gave place to that. And it doesn't take much to stimulate it. Hmm. I can remember, too, even in serious situations, watching your attitude, knowing that you don't want to give place to the enemy. Uh, there was a sad situation I saw in a grocery store where... A man uh, sent his son up to the meat counter, but, you know, he's this tall, and sent him up to the meat counter, and he was getting overlooked. Well, because the, peop the teenager that worked behind the counter couldn't even see him. And if she did see him, she would have assumed that he was with a parent. Well, this guy all of a sudden was fed up that his son was being ignored. Well, he stood way back here. So he sent that little son to the, then got mad and reamed out that teenager. Reamed out the teenager. And so I got up, I, I wanted to get with him because I thought he was pretty rude, so I want to know what was wrong with him. And when I gave him what I thought, <laughs> he basically said, look, I've got terminal cancer. And I don't care. That's the way he was dealing with it. Was that serious? Terminal cancer? Yes, it was. But my first thought was, that little boy of yours, is that the way you want him to remember you? Do you want him to remember you as the one who just uh, went all over a little teenage girl who didn't know what, that she did anything wrong? Is that what you want? You know what? You need to look for those places of your overreaction because the enemy's going to push it on Christians. He's going to hammer that same area, so you might as well deal with it. All temptation is tailor-made for you. Look at your situation. Is there any area in your, in your life that's just not working right or there's a repetitive same old, same old? Guess what? It's you. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. What part are you not doing? 
What part are you not caring for? Because a religious spirit will get to Christians and drive and impel you until you, in the worst case scenario, you blame the church, you blame Christians, you blame everybody, but never took personal responsibility to submit to God, resist. Now when I say resist, this resist is basically the peace of God that guards your heart and your mind. And the enemy will flee. Why? Because the enemy cannot penetrate the fruit of the Spirit. The enemy can't push a button if you're at peace. Jesus basically said he has nothing in me. He can't push no buttons, although I, he was legitimately tempted. Tempted, yet without sin. He had nothing in me. I can feel the pressure, but it has to go. This doesn't mean life without pressure. It means life where the response to the pressure is the peace of God that will triumph. The God of peace will crush the enemy beneath your feet. That's not poetry. That's a supernatural phenomenon. That's a spiritual po But if you can't maintain your peace, then you just get beat up. And most of the time, you're not even getting beat up by the devil. You're getting beat up by your own carnality because you've got place for the enemy to hit you. And Religious spirits will love to just come in and condemn, drive, and compel you to do wrong. Resist the devil and he will flee. Demonic activity is working from the outside to get your will. So when you're being pressured, if he can get you to move, act impulsively, he's winning. If he can get you to go and do what you even know is not right to do, he's got you. And he's going to hit you over and over again. And <clears throat> like any habit, there would be a sense that with temptation, there's always a, it's a carrot and a stick. It's a reward and punishment. He tries to reward you. Ooh, wouldn't that lustful fruit look good? Mm -mm. And you think of the reward, and then comes the crash. How many people I knew that, uh, that, that did drugs basically always used the same line? Yeah, well, I'm not like so-and-so that overdosed. I can control it. Isn't that funny how people are so confident in their control, and yet the prince of the power of the air controls them. <laughs> but they're so convinced, I can control it. I'm not like other people. All right, there's your, there's your mistake right there. You're out of control. Matter of fact, I, I don't recommend doing that, but I did that one time only to see if it worked, and it really worked. I had a person that I could feel that they, they were faking it in a counseling situation. Don't do this, okay? But I did it just to see. <laughs> and they were perfectly calm. I don't have any need. Oh, those are other people who need ministry. I don't need ministry. That's for other people, not me. And someone told me that they said this and it made somebody flip out. So I, I'm going to say it. So I'm going to say, <laughs> you're out of control. <laughs> I am not out of control. Isn't that something? So people actually fake being okay. I'm okay. I don't need ministry. Oh, you're out of control. I am not out of control. <laughs> That's what was in there all along. Don't do that, okay? That's not a nice thing to do. <laughs> but I was, I was shocked that it worked. So people can be fake. But God looks at the heart. Why not just get your heart right? Who cares what it looks like? Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. Huh? So I don't know about you, but I think we got to get rid of these religious spirits. What do you think? I don't want to act like a three-year-old if there's areas in my life I want to close that door. I don't want to try to squelch and quench and put on my religious face and look nice when I'm mad inside. I, and when I'm controlling and I want to fake the peace of God. <laughs> oh, boy. You know, the funny thing is you could probably do it for a little while. You can fool some of the people some of the time. But you can't hide what emanates. 
And people that have walls up, I don't need ministry. Have no idea how embarrassing it was. The first time that when, when as I was filled with the Spirit, and God gave me discerning of spirits, I was actually embarrassed for Christians. And it, the picture God showed me one time was, hi, I'm fine. And I'd feel anger, hurt, fear coming. Hi, I'm fine. And the Lord showed me a picture. And how many, you know what a dandelion is? It's a, a single one, not a bouquet. A single dandelion, he says, Christians are like little children hiding behind a flower, thinking nobody sees them. That's like putting a blanket over your head. If I can't see you, you can't see me. Huh? Isn't that childish? But God's looking for reality in the relationship. God's looking for, for whosoever will. So I want to pray right now that we're not going to, one, resort back to an earlier behavior of childhood. Two, we're not going to restrain and squeeze and press down stuff that's in there. I'm not going to walk around in depression. By the way, depression is you're giving place to the enemy. I don't care how you've justified depression. There's people that will justify it, and I'm sure Christians are going to try to justify it. Depression is anger toward inward. You're not getting what you want or someone's doing to you what you don't want them to do. And your control button is, is on internal. Oppression. You feel crushed, overpowered, overwhelmed, ravished. Overwhelmed, ravished, overwhelmed. You've got place. And lastly, obsess. You're so fixed on a single person, place, or thing that the enemy's going to beat you up with it. Hmm? That's called obsession. Obsession, oppression, depression, suppression. I don't care what, what's going on. Without the peace of God, you need deliverance. We're going to get deliverance. And those watching by YouTube, you say, I don't even know how I turn this station on. Well, it's because God's going to deliver you from that religious spirit. It's about the yoke of the Lord is easy and his burden is light. And you're making it hard and drudgery. You're making it being worn out. That's the strategy of the enemy. He can't get you to backslide, but he can get you to wear out. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, with the Jesus, the deliverer in me, let him rise up in me. Rise up, rise up and cast off that religious spirit. I want to be able to make a free will decision now. Some of you felt it lift even already. Now I want to close the door, Lord. Show me the door. Show me the place that I've been giving to this spirit so that it can push my buttons on a regular basis. The same old, same old means that door has not been properly closed. I receive forgiveness for opening that door. Lord's given me a word about there's someone up for sure there are multitudes because they felt oppressed as a child beaten down and abused overly controlled you locked into if I don't take control it won't get done you cannot fight control with control will not work right now I receive forgiveness for that childhood childhood law that vow that I made that I must do something or it won't get done I receive forgiveness for being general manager of my world I receive forgiveness and I'm relinquishing it back to Jesus himself to be Lord of my life
Father, we just command that we are by reason of use going to practice yielding and surrendering and being led by the Spirit of God, not compelled, not pushed, not shoved, not driven, not worn out. But it's changed. The scripture the Lord gave this week, regardless of the what we used in this message, God said, you're hearing right, Dennis. And he confirmed it with his word. And it was after the children of God were being harassed by the Philistines in 1 Samuel 7, beginning in verse 7, 7 to 17. It says, the Philistines were subdued and they did not again come into the territory of Israel and the hand of the Lord was upon them for the entire rest of the life of Samuel. He ruled in the victory and the Philistines did not even attempt to come into that territory anymore. I want that kind of a victory for you, a kind of turnaround where the enemy's not going to that same old place again. It's done. The door is closed. He has nothing in you. He cannot move in that area. So Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, let's turn the tables on the enemy. Bring confusion into his camp because the things that used to work no longer work. The tactics and the strategies to wear me out will not work anymore. I'm at peace to be led by the Spirit of God as a son and a daughter. I'm led by the Spirit. I'm not going to be ruled. Someone's getting delivered right now from pornography. It's pressed you and drove you to it. It was like an umbilical cord dragging you. Sins of fornication and adultery. Right now, you need to expose it to God. Bring the necessary cleansing. There's evil speaking to where you're murdering brother and sister with your words and thinking nothing of it. Sometimes even calling it prayer. Cleanse us, Lord, from those open doors. Wash us by the washing of the water of the word. And remember, we do not have authority to rebuke anybody unless we're walking in obedience. Unless we're walking in obedience, we don't have, we don't have the authority to correct anybody but to punish disobedience by our obedience. So Father, right now, work in me, work in us, work and cleanse us to walk in newness of life and let the supernatural peace of God guard our heart and our mind in the days ahead. Tables are turned on the enemy for whosoever will. I want you to stand together with me and make a public declaration that we decree and declare that victory belongs to us. We decree and declare that the victory belongs to us because I'm a whosoever and whosoever will abandon ourselves from the fleshly desires and appetites and bring them crucified unto the Lord. Crucified our appetites and our desires. Close that door that religious spirits are not gonna operate in our lives anymore. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We're going to follow after him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our might. Now wait for the peace to settle in. If you did it right in your heart, there's going to be a supernatural peace that's going to enter in. That's his lordship. Let the peace of God rule. I receive that the enemy doesn't have anything in me. Any button that he pushes, I'm going to submit to God, resist, and he will flee. 
physical healings. There are going to be signs and wonders that are going to begin to flow in this congregation and throughout the, the uh, internet audience. Physical healings are going to take place and it's going to be merely, merely a sign that the word's going forth to turn things around in your life. Health and healing. If you've got sickness in your body, receive it right now. Welcome the healer who lives in you to rise up. Go and sin no more. Cleanse me from the open doors that healing might flow to every part of my physical body. Allow resurrection life to flow right now into bad relationships. There are soul ties and bad relationships that need to end. Sever that attachment and attach me where it needs to belong with healthy relationships. We'll see resurrection in the area of the finances. Resurrection in the area of the physical healing. Resurrection in the area of my thought life. Resurrection in the area of the emotions. Becoming more stable, steadfast. Resurrection to spiritual hunger for more of God and deeper, richer intimacy. Greater fruitfulness in the days ahead. God, explode resurrection life in those areas of our lives. And for those of us that are praying in community, know this, it's a holy highway. And they that walk upon it need to have clean hands and a pure hearts. And we're going to pray at 9, 1, and 5. And know that the community is praying at that same time that we would see massive victory in our jurisdiction that we would see new authority in our jurisdiction that we would see the powers of darkness being pushed back and we're going to advance forward and upward in the things of God each and every one of us it's a time for spiritual promotion in the days ahead in Jesus name amen seal this work by the power of the Holy Spirit and cause us to be mindful of it Holy Spirit, quicken and remind us these things in the days ahead. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.